science behind Ruby. Last class, we were discussing the science of corundum, and I had begun to introduce the red variety of corundum, which is called Ruby. July's birthstone, and something that can cost quite a fortune as a gemstone. Today, we're going to start here with uh, capital B, the pen, capital B. And this is going to be color and optics. You guys know what the color for ruby is. Ruby must be red. And the shade of red, there's so many different shades of red, but the specific shade of red that we care about here is called blood red or pigeon blood red. It is this vivid, deeply saturated color. Variations from that are, let's go strong saturation. So this is where we're going to say most important aspect of value is this color. Depending on where you live in the world, the cutoffs for ruby color are different. So this is an image from GIA, which is going into color. You can have anything that's a strong purplish red up to an orangey red that's possible for ruby. Specifically in Asian countries, they allow much more pinks than we do in the United States. In the United States, it's largely red with just a slight orange or slight purple that could be allowed. This pigeon blood color that I was mentioning, this is what color I want you to visualize. It's this really bright um, color. You can have rubies that are a little darker, like so this one is from Burma, and it's the classic pigeon's blood color. This is a darker Thai ruby, and you can see that it is not quite as vibrant or bright, but it's still worth a lot as a precious ruby. So number two under optics and color is going to be the cause of the color. Let's see, so number two is cause. The cause of the color. Well, in this case, it's a chromophore of chromium. So we have trace amounts. It's about up to one weight percent as it can have that it can have of chromium three plus, and that's the chromophore that will end up replacing some aluminum. Chromium three plus replaces some aluminum in the crystal lattice. And what that does is it creates a different electron environment, which absorbs light differently. So let's say it replaces some aluminum. We're going to just put here that it creates a bit of a different electron environment. And it's that different electron environment that makes some light be absorbed differently and gives us, well, everything's absorbed except for red, right? And it's the red that comes through. Now, when there are trace amounts of other impurities, the color is changing. So it's this chrome 3 plus here that gives us this bright cherry pigeon blood red. When you have small amounts of iron, so we're going to say here, iron imparts a darker color. So to have red, you have to have chromium 3 plus. And then as you have iron added with the chromium 3 plus, then you get a darker tone. So in this case, this is only iron 3 plus. Oh, I said that wrong. This is only chrome 3 plus. This is chrome 3 plus plus some iron. And in fact, we could probably do this, right? So here we're going to put CR 3 plus plus some iron to make it dark. Where this one here is going to be pure chrome 3 plus to give the color. And so this has a geologic control, where you can have iron and where you cannot. And so we have corundum that forms primarily in marbles and in basalts, right? I talked about that in one of the previous lectures. Well, basalts are a rock type with abundant iron. And so we would expect that if we have ruby in a basalt, it should be a slightly darker ruby. Whereas if you have ruby coming from a marble, like the famous rubies from Mogok, they are, um, they're basically no iron. And so you can have this really bright color. Now there's one other effect that has going on here, and that is fluorescence. So what ends up happening is that fluorescence is caused 
by chromium 3 plus as well. And remember what fluorescence is. That's where you can take UV energy, either from a black light or even from sunlight, and it releases additional energy from electrons dropping orbitals, right? We talked about that earlier in the semester. And so what we have here is UV in sunlight releases extra red light from the stone. Extra red light from stone. And so you can almost get this glowing red color when there is the effect of fluorescence. But when iron is present, it will deaden that fluorescence response. Okay, so those are our th three reasons for the red color. It's importantly chrome 3 plus that it will also produce a fluorescence that can then get darkened by um, iron. As we look in more detail, there can be something called color zoning in a lot of rubies. It's not something we like. We want a pure red color. But color zoning can occur where there is a darker core, either a blacker core or a purpler core. This is something that makes some rubies less valuable. So we can have a darker core in some ruby. To draw that, we could say, okay, so let's just draw a, a ruby. Ruby is a hexagonal crystal. Uh-oh, that's a pentagon. Draw yours as a hexagon, students. Uh-huh, there it is. And then what will end up happening is we can get a core that's a little darker that makes this stone look less beautiful. Of course, in all instances, draw your notes much more cleaner and beautiful than mine because I'm drawn on this tablet and it ends up being hard to control the pen. Now another aspect that we can see inside of rubies sometimes that is valuable, let's not call it silk, that's where we're headed, but it's inclusions. And inclusions have both a positive and a negative effect. The negative effect is they block light and they're this imperfection. But there's a positive effect as well and that is the inclusions are this fingerprint that tells us where um, the stone comes from. So this can create for us a positive and negative effect. The negative effect is the blocking of light and sometimes when it's the strongest amount of inclusions in a ruby it's a, it's a type of pattern called silk and what silk looks like is here's our hexagon drawn better this time and inside we get a bunch of rutile needles that align up with the crystal lattice all right, so I'm drawing them in like this. And those will block light and create a fuzziness. Let's go with this. These are called rutile needles. Now, of course, this can be taken advantage of as well. Let me show you. Uh, let's see. Here's a picture, a real picture. This is from Lotus Gemology of rutile silk inside of, sort of looks like our drawing, inside of a ruby. Right? Most of the time that is a negative feature, except for in the instances where we cut the gemstone to look like a star to produce asterism. So in that case, they're usually cabochons, and there's this bright area that goes down the middle of the stone. That's the asterism. You'll remember that picture here. So this is how a star ruby would be made. Is, based, is trying to take advantage of the negative feature of silk. Of course, the positive feature of all inclusions is that they are a geographic fingerprint that lets you know where the stone comes from and that it's real, not synthetic. Fingerprint. That's the positive aspect of our inclusions. So now let's, we're we just have a couple more sections to go through of Ruby before this lecture is done. Well, the next heading is going to be C, and it's going to be called Treatments and Synthetics. Like everything in the world, if there is value attached to it, people are going to try to cheat their way into taking your money. And so some of these things are accepted. There are synthetic rubies that people want to buy, and there's other ones that you don't want to buy them. You don't know that they're fake. Right? And the same thing is with treatments. There are certain treatments that are accepted and others that are not. So the first thing we're going to say here is that an unheated, untreated stone, 
unheeded, untreated is the goal. But the fact is we cannot afford those. Only the richest of the rich can un, can afford an unheeded, untreated pigeon's blood red. And so what ends up happening is that almost all rubies, it's something like 95% of rubies are heat treated. So we'll go almost all rubies are heat treated. And what that means is you take the ruby, you put it in a furnace, maybe heat it up to 1,000 degrees Celsius or 1,500 degrees Celsius for a period of days. And what that does is it changes both the silk. So what it does is it's going to remove the inclusions, remove silk and the dark spots, the color zoning, and it also will remove color zoning. And even, and even it will um, get rid of the dark color. So we'll even put down here lighten dark stones, basically by driving off the iron. And this is accepted. I'm going to put it over here. This is an accepted process. If you see rubies at the jewelry store, they have almost certainly been heat treated, and it's totally okay. Now, there's other things that are less okay. But because rubies are worth a lot of money and because they're so rare as a commodity, these are marginally accepted. So we're just going to say marginally to sometimes accepted. And if it's reported and the jeweler is being transparent with you, then it is accepted. If they're not telling you that it's occurring, then they're basically being thieves. And so what they'll end up doing is with the heating, they'll do heating plus filler. And what the filler does, it ends up being like it's oftentimes a leaded glass. So PB is the chemical formula for lead. So it is a leaded glass that fills cracks. And what this does is that it improves clarity. And so you can take a stone that is not marketable, but fill the cracks with leaded glass, and you improve that clarity, and you're able to sell, sell it. So this is okay if it's reported, but the stones will be worth much less money. Let's even put that down here. Le worth less money. What does this look like in practice? Let me show you a guy who is heating rubies. This is an image also from GIA. This would be someone maybe in Thailand who is blowing oxygen onto a fire to get the coals hot to heat the rubies. This is a primitive technique for heating and doing glass filling. And there's much more mechanized way of doing this as well. But this is still a common approach today. And then the last thing under this uh, heading is going to be, let's see what number are we on, number four, and that's just pure synthetics. All right, so here it is. Four is synthetics. It ends up being very easy to take aluminum powder. If you could take an AL203 powder, which is very cheap, you can heat it in a crucible, powder, and you can actually just create a synthetic ruby this way. So AL203 powder is melted and crystallizes to ruby. This is the cheapest of all the rubies because it is not natural. But rubies that come in class, class rings, what's a, re, what's a red college near us? Texas A&M, for example, this, this is where their class rings might have ruby inside of them. Well, it's not precious natural ruby. It would just be synthetic ruby. All right. Last topic for rubies is going to be sources. Just want to walk you through the different places on earth where rubies come from. And there's not that many of them. In fact, you know what we should do? Should we start with a map first? Let's start with a map first, lifted from GIA. It's a kind of a nice map, I think. So here we go. Sources. There's not that many. There's a whole suite in Asia, a suite in Africa, and then this one spot in Greenland that isn't quite yet economically viable because it's a hard place to do mining, but these are the places in the world where rubies come from. We're going to go I'll start here at the bottom, the top of the pen. There we go. So number one is an area in Asia called Myanmar or Burma. So find Myanmar. Here it is right here. This is the 
historically most famous place for all of rubies. They've been mined here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is one place I do want you to know. So this is historically the most famous site for rubies. If you're going to buy a ruby to sell to a king, it's going to come from an area in Burma even that's called Mogok. And that's probably getting a little deeper than where this class needs to be. But the rubies from Mogok are the beautiful pigeon red crystallizing from marble. So that means they have low iron and they have the beautiful pigeon blood color. Thailand is probably the next most important place we need to talk about. Thailand produces rubies and was the world's leader in ruby production. It makes the darker rubies. So these are basalt hosted which means they have iron and they're a little dark, hosted, they're dark. But what ended up happening is Thailand kind of ran out of all their rubies, but they had this amazing infrastructure set up to heat treat and produce synthetics. And so nowadays Thailand is still the primary area for ruby export, even though they're not mining it. So how should we say that? Let's say now um, basalt is dark, but this kind of ran out as a source. And so now they are the place that cuts rubies and treats rubies that are mined all over the world, right? Let's say that from all over the world. What does that mean? Well, that means all these other sources are funneling their rubies into Thailand and then Thailand sends them out to Japan and the US, right? The big buying markets. Uh, that's generally the story for this area. The the Nepalese, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, these are rubies that are not being mined in high enough volume yet, but they can be stunning. Sri Lankan rubies tend to be more pink, and in the US we call them just pink sapphires. But let's talk about Africa as our final place. Africa ends up being the number one producer today of rubies. So largest source of rubies today is Africa. And it's coming from a variety of different countries that are all located along what's called the Mozambique Belt, which is an ancient mountain belt. The, let's see, Madagascar are countries, we can list the countries here, we see them on the map above, but Madagascar, Tanzania, and then Mozambique. These are big sources. If you're buying a ruby today, it's almost certainly to be from one of these countries. And with that, I think we could wrap it up. We, we can't really talk about prices or anything like that because those change so much with time. But if you've got these main ideas about where, where rubies are coming from, some of the good things about rubies and how synthetics and heating is done a lot of the time, that I think you understand this stone. Well, all right, see you next time as we go into Sapphire.